The year is 2015. I was 19 years old in my home country of Nepal. As an aid worker in the foothills of Mount Everest, I saw something quite strange. Every night, the staff at my hotel would hike uphill for two hours, leaving the guests behind. I, I was surprised. Why would someone walk for two hours every night after a long days of work? Later on, I realized that they were scared and they were going to a safer place. Yes, they were scared of a flood, a flood in the mountains. They were scared of the constantly expanding glacial lakes that were formed in the Himalayas because of global warming. This was a big and powerful moment for me. And while I had studied about climate change in school, this one particular experience shaped how I take climate change and pursue it in my career. Looking back at my younger self, that made a lot of sense. I was born in the Himalayas, and I traveled extensively with my father, who was an entomologist. We studied bees and butterflies together. Butterflies are in my stomach now. <laughs> <laughs> Moving forward, acknowledging and reminiscing my past, I realized that the present and future generation may not have the memories that I shared in my past. Some of my fondest memories are of me and my dad traveling around the Himalayas, exploring the natural beauty of the world. And that was the moment when I decided that I want to pursue a career in combating climate change. And over the past four years, I've tried to grab every opportunity I can to be involved in containing this crisis. Over my summers, I interned at the World Wildlife Fund in Australia, trying to protect the Great Barrier Reef. In the UAE, I've traveled with the UAE Ministry of Environment in climate negotiations as a youth delegate. And on campus, I'm well known for constantly nagging NYU Abu Dhabi senior administration for trying to make the campus more sustainable. And while I've traveled the world and seen the first-hand impacts of climate change, there was still something that was missing in my life. You see, I'm a person of memory, a person who keeps a diary in the present day of social media. So I often looked back into my days in the Himalayas and up at Everest, and I wondered what must be happening to the people who live there. The Himalayas is not just an aesthetic mountain range. It's the third largest source of fresh water and polar ice caps after Antarctica and the Arctic. However, the present discourse on the Himalayas is just about Everest. To be precise, death or trash at Mount Everest. Very seldom people actually know that 27% of the Himalayas has already melted, putting one-fourth of the world's population in risk of water scarcity. The second biggest problem with constantly melting ice in the Himalayas is this concept of glacial flooding. As the glaciers are retreating, there's a lot of meltwater being accumulated to form big lakes, and these lakes are extremely vulnerable and susceptible to bursting, causing downstream flash flood and having the potential to wiping down millions of people who reside in downstream communities. And while I was doing my research and trying to figure out what's actually happening back home in the Himalayas, I was only subjected with a lot of science and equations about climate change, something I couldn't really resonate well with. I often wondered, where are the people that, 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 that are being affected by climate change? Why is climate change not personalized? And I questioned, why is climate change so much about science, data, and equations, while it should really be about nature, people, animals, and our interaction? So I finally decided to ditch my corporate summer plans, and I moved down to Nepal. I got on a motorbike and tra started traveling, started from the border of India, up north towards China, and for people who know me, my bicycle wasn't very happy that I got on a motorbike. But the road could only take me so far. You see, there are no roads up in the mountains, so I had to start walking. And that's what I did for the next 12 days towards my big destination of Choralba Glacial Lake. And there it is. Choralba Glacial Lake is one of the most vulnerable glacial lakes in the world. Standing in front of this lake was a powerful feeling. It was beautiful, no doubt, but also to acknowledge that this lake might be the cause for deaths of millions of people was a strange and bizarre experience. One that questioned my understanding of nature, one that questioned how I see things in its face value. You see, 60, 70 years ago, the lake was non-existent. 957, it's nothing. 30 years down the road, the lake suddenly expanded to form a huge lake and got attention from Japanese scientists studying things in the mountains. 
they notified the Nepalese government, and together they decided to pro install a proper drainage, as you can see in the map in 20, um, 20, 2003. And while this lake has decreased in its surface level since then, the biggest problem to the country is there are more than 1,600 such lakes in the Himalayas. And the government is not capable of doing this to every lake. But this talk is so much more about the people rather than the lake. And in my experience of spending the three months in the Himalayas, I encountered a lot of stories that resonated with how I felt when I was a child. You see, water plays a very central role in all of our lives. Glacier melting, sea level rise, to even just a small alien water bottle. Water's everywhere in our lives. Water plays a central characteristic in all the stories we read when we're a little boy or a girl. So my talk is essentially about people, their story of the lake and water. According to certain traditional beliefs in the Himalayas, there used to be a huge garden for yaks to herd. One night, the mountain gods came to the dreams of local Sherpa people and told them to take their yaks away. The people disagreed. The next morning when they woke up, there was a huge lake that had formed after the mountains had melted. A lot of yaks were killed. And this was the formation of the lake, according to a lot of them. And these beliefs, strongly rooted on fate, as well as strongly rooted on act of God, were dominant in all of the conversations I had in the Himalayas. For some people, they believed consequences and natural disasters were also an act of God. People were particularly unhappy with the recent inflow of migrant workers from the south of Nepal to help rebuild the communities after the earthquake. They told me, we're very upset that these people are here. They are not accustomed to local customs and traditions, and they're urinating and defecating near the river sources. There was a flood a day before I was there, so when I asked these people what was the cause of the flood, they said, it's because they urinated and defecated, and the mountain gods were upset. And for someone like me, it was quite amazing to hear all these experiences, and I couldn't really figure out what it means and how should I fathom this information. Moving forward, I want to introduce you to Jammu Sherpa. I had the privilege of staying with her for a week when I was traveling up in the Himalayas, and she is a character, a very good one, of course. Like many people in the mountains, she believes in fatalism, an idea that everything is inevitable, and at the end of the day, you don't have control over what happens in your life. It's a strange story. One of the favorite things about her is she has 12 pet goats, and she just takes care of them for fun. So when the earthquake actually happened, everyone from the Himalayas were moving outwards, and they were trying to escape. But she was in the city. She actually went back to the mountains because her pet goats were in her house, and she wanted to take care of them. And when I asked her why she did that, she told me, if I had to die, I would die anyway. Her analogy in relating earthquake and climate change was also particularly interesting. As a little boy, I spent a lot of time doing earthquake drills. Nepal lies between the Himalayas, sandwiched between China and India, so we're always told that earthquakes are going to happen in the country. So she told me that earthquakes and climate change is similar. There's a lot of uncertainty. We know it's happening, and we know it's going to happen at some point, but we don't know when. So does that mean I stop working and start thinking about climate change and not doing anything? No. You put it in the back of your head, you move on, and you work in order to put food in your family's table. And it's not just that. For a lot of people, climate change is actually a good thing. The picture you see here is of a very famous pass called Tasi Lapcha Pass. Sir Edmund Hillary himself, one of the pioneers climbing Everest in the first place, he acknowledged that this is one of the hardest passes to cross in the world. With climate change, what's happening is a lot of snow is melting, and there's not a lot of snow in the mountains anymore. So these extremely difficult passes are opening up, which means a lot of new tourists can actually come and explore the Himalayas. So when I encountered these tour guides who are scoping a potential trek for new tourists, they're quite excited about the idea of climate change. And while they agreed that climate change is happening, they said in the short run, it's actually helping them get jobs. One of the most interesting things about this particular pass is that it provides a much needed alternative route to Everest. And as you know, as you may have heard, Everest is full of people. So having an alternative route is going to be a strong boost for the local economy. Economy and climate change. I'm sure you've heard of these two terms together before. But something that really, really caught my attention the most was the concept that climate change is a hoax. 
it's quite, quite bizarre to even imagine that people living in the most vulnerable communities would think climate change is a hoax. And I attribute this for two reasons. One, skepticism over the government's intent. You see, the government hasn't done much in this part of the world. There are no roads in the mountains, there are no health posts, there are no schools. And suddenly, the government decides that they want to spend tens of millions of dollars to save the very same people from climate change. Sounds a bit off, doesn't it? Second, what this translates is end to American imperialism and yes to Nepalese communism. And there's quite strong discourse in the country in terms of foreigners, and especially people from the West, as well as Japan for some reason, coming to the country to mine the Himalayas. The Himalayas is believed to have rare minerals and gems which are extremely valuable. So every time there are things happening with foreigners coming into the country for research, people are very skeptical that they actually want to mine the Himalayas. So these two regions were some of the strongest for people to think that climate change is a planned hoax. I didn't want to settle into that conclusion. So I decided that I wanted to study the young population. However, the problem was there are no young people in the mountains because there are no opportunities there. So I trekked back down, went to the biggest um, city nearby where a lot of young people have emigrated, and I studied the young population. So I conducted a survey among the young people to figure out what's their opinion on climate change. And I was surprised. 37% of my sample size, of 420 people almost, think climate change, particularly glacial flooding, is a hoax. And within that, 42% of people who live in high-risk zones, which is next to the riverbanks, think it's a hoax. Further, I tried to study their awareness perception. And I wanted to study how much they actually care about climate change. As an economist, I tried to understand how much tax they're willing to pay to solve climate change and to adapt to it. And I found very interesting results. Students were exceptionally well aware of what's happening in the climate change. They were exposed to a 10-question quiz, which they scored brilliantly with. However, what was driving them to pay more taxes and to actually care more about the environment was not awareness, but it was their perception. And after calculating a perception index, I found out that the higher their perception towards climate change, the more they would actually care about. And this is quite interesting because perception was made up of questions like, do you actually care about climate change? Do you think it's going to affect you and your family? What's your interaction with nature? Have you been in a natural disaster before? What do you think is your biggest priority moving forward? And this differentiation between awareness and perception is not very straightforward. It's very diluted as well. And they're not mutually exclusive either. You need both. However, it really strongly resonated with me four years ago. I was a well aware and educated person who was volunteering in Everest. But I didn't care much about climate change as much as I should have. But that one experience really changed my perception towards climate change. So my idea is pretty simple. We need to focus and find opportunities to be vulnerable. We need to find opportunities to live amongst the most vulnerable people to climate change. And we need to find opportunities to interact with nature, be vulnerable to climate change, and that is how we can move away from awareness to perception. For people sitting here today, what makes you sitting in this chair so passionate about climate change compared to someone else in the next seat who doesn't care about climate change? Or even if they care about climate change, we're not doing anything on climate change. In no way am I saying that you need to catch the next flight and go to Everest. That would be great for our economy and I highly recommend. But I don't think it's about doing the same thing that people have been doing and finding this one story that's going to resonate with you. You see, everyone has a different story. And in this talk, I can't fully talk about all the different stories that I encountered. So my question to you is, what's your story with the environment? What's your story with climate change? If you have a story, how do you move forward with it? And if you don't have a story, you need to question why you don't have a story with the environment. And what does that say about the world we're living in today? The mountains are melting. For people who live in these regions, they have nothing to do than to adapt to climate change by pushing the idea that climate change is real out of their head. You can call that a forced denial. During the night, and during the time of crisis, people are climbing up the hills in order to survive. But who says the flood is only going to hit during the night? What will they do if it hits during the day? What does our future entail? And what are we going to do about it? Or do we just listen to the words of John Musherpa, 
that fate decide. Thank you.